Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm your host, Kelee Akina. Today is March 16th, 2020, and the reason I'm giving you the date is because time is moving very quickly and events are happening at a rapid pace, especially concerning the outbreak of the coronavirus across the world. We are now in the midst of what the World Health Organization tells us is a global pandemic. I have with me today an interesting person who has many good perspectives to add to what's being said on the media. She is Dr. Mai Wang, a doctor of acupuncture and oriental medicine and an engineer. She's the CEO of Rivermap Research and Consulting, LLC. Dr. Wang has a unique integrated background in computer engineering and traditional Chinese medicine. So she brings together both the East and the West. Dr. Wang started her research in pathogen genome analysis back in 2007. Uh, she invented the RiverMap DNA model and the novel pathogen DNA analysis software called Genado, and that actually predicted the symptoms and health impacts of the H1N1 virus in 2009, and she's done the same for the COVID-19 now in 2020. Now, Dr. Wang is, was also the professor of Materia Medica and school clinic director in the Clinical Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine uh, Institute in Hawaii from 2013 to 2018. She believes that the integration of modern DNA technology and traditional differential diagnosis will enable alternative medicine practitioners to better understand infectious diseases so they can really contribute in helping patients during pandemics. The only thing I would add at this point is a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, we are not in any way going to provide medical advice nor policy advice. The reason I'm bringing Dr. Wang into our program today is because the media is filled with talk about the coronavirus, and she has perspectives that you may not get from the United States. So please welcome to the program, Dr. Mai Wong. Dr. Wong, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, you're all the way in Hong Kong now, so it's actually tomorrow. And let me just jump right into it because we've got so much to cover. Tell me what's going on in Hong Kong in terms of the coronavirus outbreak, and how are people responding? Are, are they panicking? Yeah, um, well, let me give you the official number for today because I, <laughs> I look it up this morning. For we today. We have uh, four, <laughs> for today, 155 confirmed cases and four died so far. Uh, this number was since we started looking at the coronavirus uh, in January. So uh, I think this is an okay number compared to uh, you know, many places in the world now. Um, the situation seems to be uh, under control. Um, so the government actually uh, allowed the schools to close uh, for two months now, and they are going to be closed until I think Easter, and then we'll decide what to do after that. And the uh, uh, government employees um, were allowed to work from home for one month, and now. Well, now they are they have to go back to work uh, since March 2nd. I think this is a reason um, because the Hong Kong government have to follow uh, the steps of Beijing. I think that's one of the reasons. Uh, let me ask you a, a, a let me ask you a question. In, yeah. uh, in terms of the way that there has been a public response to the coronavirus spread in Hong Kong, uh, do, do you think that uh, it, it has been a good response? Do you think that it's effective? And do you think that it's uh, taking Hong Kong where it should be? Uh, where are you talking about? Hong Kong? In uh, Hong Kong. Or the world? In Hong Kong. Uh, in Hong Kong, I think um, there was still uh, a panic uh, in the beginning. Now it's a little better because people see that uh, the numbers are not growing too fast. Um, and also, uh, because people here in Asia, they have been through um, SARS, and actually, people talk about SARS only, actually, they have been through many uh, infectious disease attacks, like the bird flus and uh, H1N1, uh, they got everything. So people are uh, probably well-educated how to handle, uh, you know, a, a pandemic like this. I see. Or actually better understanding. Uh, so they, 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 they are alert, um, uh, but there's still actually a panic. Actually, we started earlier. So in early February, I have already lined up uh, 
with everyone to try to fight for food and toilet paper. Uh, you know, if you see things happening in U.S. and uh, just because there's a delay, <laughs> well, we start earlier, and so uh, the same thing here. Um, but actually, it seems a little calmer right now. Uh, I think one of the key reason why we can keep the numbers low, also same thing in uh, Taiwan and also um, Korea, although they have a huge number for different reasons, but there are not that many people died. And also Japan is because the same reason uh, we all been through SARS and then wearing masks is one of the key. Wearing masks and wash hands. Well, at least I'm maintaining at least six feet distance from you right now. So we've got our healthcare I practice. Know. Let me, uh, let, me you know you to, well, let me ask <laughs> you to uh, share a little bit about your background, which is very interesting. You are a research scientist, but you're also right. a healthcare practitioner. And you've got, right. you, you have really many accomplishments in both fields, including in your work with H1N1. Can you tell us a little bit about how you, about your background, both in Western science and traditional Chinese medicine? Uh, yes, um, I started as a uh, engineer. I worked in Silicon Valley for many years. Um, well, I had a very bad surgery uh, in my 20s uh, because uh, the doctors, when he was trying to do a uh, thyroid surgery, and somehow he cut my uh, sympathetic nerve. So I have a lot of side effects and I need to live through, um, you know, many things. And I went to see different doctors and it doesn't seem uh, there was a solution for my problem. So I uh, ended up uh, trying to study Chinese medicine to help myself. <laughs> and so uh, one thing did to another. So um, I ended up doing this uh, for more than 10 years now, uh, practicing and teaching Chinese medicine and also doing research at the same time because I was really interested in DNA because it was the blueprint, or it is actually, the blueprint uh, of all uh, life forms on Earth. And, you know, if you consider there are only uh, five components and people said four because A, T, C, G, and, but actually I consider the backbone as one too. So, uh, so five things, uh, four things, and that actually contribute to all the creation of living things on Earth. So I was really interested in that. So that's how I started my research. I'm just curious. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm still doing that. And yeah, and you did give me uh, a lot of things and, uh, you know, uh, taught me a lot of things during the research. And the reason that I was looking at pathogens, not uh, human DNA, pathogen DNA was because when I started, I started in 2007. At the time I can find uh, pathogen DNAs online mostly, uh, really, and plus the tools and everything was uh, too expensive for me, um, you know, to look at human DNAs. Uh, so pathogen DNA were perfect because I was testing my uh, algorithm, the algorithm I created and the software I created, trying to decode the thing and see, you know, uh, and try to link the pathogen DNA with disease uh, and the symptoms they create inside the human body. And so far, um, I have to say it was, uh, uh, it was uh, successful and I was very happy about it, especially in uh, 2009 when I, uh, uh, you know, work on the H1N1 and actually see some real patients, then uh, the strategy worked. That gave me a lot of confidence. <laughs> well, you've accomplished quite a bit, especially in terms of creating a, a computer model that helped to tell us what the impact and the, the growth of the H1N1 virus was all about. Here, I've got another question for you. Uh, can you explain okay. to us in non-scientific terms exactly what the coronavirus is? How did it get started? What does it do to people? How do we contract it? Explain that in very simple terms. Okay, let me try. <clears throat> well, first of all, I want to say something really important is H, uh, not H1N1. Uh, the COVID-19, that's its name now. Uh, the COVID-19 is not a simple flu. Uh, uh, no, many people say it's just a flu. It is not. It's a lot more than just a flu and it's more dangerous than a flu, it's more deadly than a flu because uh, the fatality rate for, uh, for uh, COVID-19 
is 3.4 percent, while the flu is generally 0.1 percent. It's like 40 times more, and it's very easy to transmit. Um, you know, from person to person, uh, there are different models uh, that uh, came out from different institutes. And some people create the R0 number, which is, you know, how fast uh, the disease can transmit, uh, how many people one person can pass to other people. Some people said two and some people said six. So, um, you know, it, it's, but anyway, it's a lot faster. And initially, uh, well, it was first discovered uh, in Wuhan, China. That's why it was initially called the Wuhan Seafood Market Pneumonia Virus it has a very long name. Uh, but now, you know, it's called COVID-19. Um, so it's a virus that will attack your lungs, create pneumonia. Uh, that's what first people saw. That's why it got its name. It's called pneumonia virus. And people uh, believe that it's close to SARS, but now they know it's a lot more than just SARS. And um, Actually, my research and actually has been confirmed by many uh, reports now that it will attack many organs in your body. It will attack starting from your brain, your CNS system, your lungs, your heart, your liver, your kidney, your spleen. And also it will definitely weaken your immune system and it will also fluctuate your blood pressure. We um, only have so a, a minute also... left uh, right now before the break. So let me ask you real oh. quickly, how does one catch the COVID-19? Right, there are many ways. Uh, there are like the major way is through the uh, droplet uh, in the air. So, you know, if we're sitting next to each other, we better wear a mask because we don't know who actually carries that because many people who actually uh, are the carriers of the virus, uh, they do not have symptoms, but they're able to spread the disease. So that's why. Um, you know, uh, through, uh, you know, coughs, knees, uh, you know, etc. And also, you know, by touching surfaces, because this virus survived on metal, wood, fabric, cardboard uh, for days. So if you touch those contaminated surfaces and then you touch your eyes, nose and mouth, and then you're going to catch the virus. That's something, you know, uh, we're going to take a quick break now. But when we come back, I want to ask you a bit about the research that you have done into what the coronavirus is all about and some things that some people may not know. And also whether or not traditional Chinese medicine has an approach to handling it. My guest today is Dr. Mai Wong. She's both a healthcare practitioner and a research scientist who has worked on viruses in the past and is currently working on research on the coronavirus COVID-19 situation. I'm Kili'i Akina on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Don't go away, we're gonna come right back. Aloha, I'm Daylan Yanagita, one of our hosts of our Business in Hawaii talk show on the Think Tech Hawaii. The theme of Business in Hawaii is to share with you stories of local businesses by local people, and our guests share with us their journey to building a successful business right here at home. We are streamed live on Think Tech weekly at 2 p.m. on Thursdays. Thank you so much for watching our show. I am Daylan Yanagita, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Everybody's talking about the spread of COVID-19 across the world. And today we've had new announcements from the government here in Hawaii as to restrictions on behavior and activities. And uh, in the midst of this, we need to have a deeper understanding. I'm gonna go back to my guest today, Dr. Mai Wong, and ask her another question. Uh, Mai, uh, you operate a scientific research group known as the River Map Research and Consulting Company. And you've examined pathogen DNA in relationship to the coronavirus. 
In fact, you discovered, I believe, that there are more than one strain of the COVID-19. Can you tell us about that and how you managed to come about this discovery? Right. Um, you know, there's a central uh, pathogen DNA database managed by the government. Uh, the group that managed this database is uh, NCBI. So uh, when a pandemic <coughs> happened like this, everybody get online to submit their uh, sequences or the sequences from uh, their region. So we can see uh, the gathering of all the sequences uh, all around the world. And uh, what I did was I run through the software I developed because we predict symptoms. Uh, so I run through all the genome sequences of the uh, COVID-19 and I discovered there are like three repeated patterns. And uh, I first discovered that in early February, uh, I released my report to CDCs and you know, Hong Kong University and also uh, the doctors in Wuhan. Um, until today, uh, I have tested, uh, I think more than 90 sequences that was uh, submitted to the same database because I track it every few days. And then I still see the same three patterns. They didn't go outside of those three patterns. And so I'm pretty confident that was right. So the three patterns tells me there are actually uh, three strains actually. Um, Nobody mentions that because nobody really know that. Everybody thinks it's one virus, so it's one virus. Uh, but you know, uh, the thing is, the three different viruses they may create uh, conflicting symptoms, and uh, you know that's why you know a lot of uh, doctors or researchers uh, you will hear. Uh, that people mentioning that uh, this virus is so sneaky and uh, so tricky because they have like they they create fever or they do not create fever. Uh, some people have like high fever, dry mouth, dry cough, and some people cough with uh, a lot of phlegms and then have chills instead of fever, etc. So, um, I mean, different strains uh, work together. Although I have to say there is one dominant string. I call them S1, S2, S3, and then S1 is the dominant one. So you will see the ratio is like maybe uh, S1 is like uh, to uh, S2 is like 5 to 1 or to S3 is like 7 to 1. So this one definitely is the dominant one and the main thing that we see in the West. However, uh, you know, uh, the other two do exist. The, it, it is like, that's why and I started to, uh, initially I only saw the S1, S2 from the submissions from China. Now I started to see it outside of China. So what that means is uh, you're going to see conflict and confusing symptoms. So whatever the criteria we gave to the people for diagnosis may not stand, um, uh, may change, you know, uh, from time to time. And uh, also, uh, you know, people who are developing vaccines and drugs need to be very careful because you might be helping one group, so your uh, product works for one group of the patients, it might, you know, be harmful to the other group. So when I uh, come up with, uh, you know, a TCM uh, solution to, you know, help people uh, to prevent the disease, uh, I will not say it will cure the disease, um, you know, it's trying to avoid things that will uh, cause harm to uh, any group of those people. Well, this uh, doesn't make me feel very easy, actually, now realizing that there are three strains out there and that confuses the whole process of diagnosis and the development of treatment. So what is the implication of that for a potential cure or a potential treatment until we get a cure? Right. Uh, that's why it is not easy. And uh, people are rushing to develop one solution uh, to fit all. I think it's actually difficult and they're having a risk of develop developing one product. It, it, it does work for the most uh, people because I said there's one dominant strain, but still, uh, you know, uh, it may have a danger or major side effect on other groups. Maybe those are small minority groups. Uh, who contract S2 and S3, but still it might be, 
you know, harmful to them. I think that people need to know that and um, need to be very careful about it. So even if we don't see the anticipated symptoms, we have to be careful anyway, because there, we could still be dealing with a strain of COVID-19 that we are unfamiliar with. Now, let me... Uh, yes, and actually, you know what? Uh, yes. uh, a lot of people who has this disease do not show symptoms. Right. Uh, so they're asymptomatic, but they walk around uh, near you, and they may still be able to pass the disease to you. That's why wearing masks is very important. And I have one story that people, uh, I think it came out from like Korea or um, somewhere in Asia. You know, two people, they uh, travel just by taking the same elevator and they're not wearing masks. They didn't even talk. And then the, the virus were transmitted from one person to another. It and sounds also, like you know, we have budget, to be very the, cautious. Yes, yes. I think uh, uh, I'm trying to get this message through that wearing a mask is important. Uh, it's not just for people who are sick, but in this case, you don't know who is sick because a lot of people don't even have symptoms. Now, how far away are we from finding a, a cure for this virus? Are we talking years from now? Are we talking months from now? What is your estimate of the science taking place? Well, um, I don't have the details, but I know that the first vaccine uh, started its clinical trial today. Uh, and then, but people said that's just clinical trial, so it might be a year away. And there is a, a drug, uh, there are actually multiple uh, drug products uh, from, uh, you know, developed from different parts of the world. But in the US, uh, certainly one is uh, um, making a lot of headlines is uh, called Rendaxivir from uh, Yulia. And I think uh, the people have seen good results uh, from these drugs. Uh, uh, you know, by treating, you know, one of, I will say, S1 uh, symptoms. Uh, but the only thing is we don't know its side effect. This is a drug that they were used to uh, treat Ebola before. So um, it seems it has uh, good results uh, in controlling this disease. But I don't know how many uh, months away. It should be at least months away because they're just having clinical trial right now. In addition to your training in Western science and engineering, you're also an expert in traditional Chinese medicine. You have a doctorate in acupuncture and oriental Chinese medicine. Can you tell us what that is? Sometimes it's called TCM, traditional Chinese medicine. Yeah. And, and what does it have to offer to this coronavirus situation? Right. Um... You know, what China did is uh, China, uh, when they were trying the, the drugs from the West, uh, they're also trying uh, Chinese medicine at the same time. And they do see uh, some success there, uh, although you might have some political reasons in there. But uh, I do believe uh, they have some success. Uh, but for me, uh, you know, understanding the disease is the, the most important thing. But once you understand it, uh, then you can use, uh, you know, herbs or dietary or acupuncture to control the disease. Um, and I did release a report um, or approach. It's called, uh, I think, a TCM approach to fight uh, uh, 2019 uh, coronavirus. Um, and in there, I... Um, basically uh, listed the herbal formulas and uh, um, you know the acupuncture points the dietary approach and also a lifestyle change and what you can do to prevent the disease sorry about my cat and then um, oh the key thing there is because I, I said you need to understand uh, the disease first is because there's one good news about the disease is uh, is self restraint. You know what it means is at the end uh, the the thing will balance itself and um, the symptoms will just disappear by itself. But the thing is because it creates so many dramatic symptoms in between, uh, many people cannot survive through the process, so they die in between. So if we can't. Um, you know, we need to dance with this virus and treat the symptoms and boost our immunity so we can fight through the end and this thing will disappear. 
what is one or two things that people can do to protect themselves in addition to wearing a mask? Oh, besides wearing a mask, uh, wash your hands. So I said, you know, all these, uh, the, the virus will, will, will stay on all the surfaces I mentioned for days. So you make sure that you wash your hands after you touch things especially after you're coming back, if you touch elevator uh, buttons that even you, uh, you know, uh, carry a, a box, uh, you know, uh, the virus can stay on a box. So wash your hands is the um, second most important thing. And the third thing is avoid the crowd. Uh, I mean, stay at home <laughs> is a good thing. <laughs> I have been staying at home for the last month or so. Uh, so, I mean, mostly, mostly. So, um, Anyway, so uh, these are the three most important things that people can follow. I mean, this disease really tests the uh, wisdom of the government and the discipline of the citizens. I mean, you need to be disciplined and to avoid, uh, you know, uh, the numbers from uh, exploding. Because if too many people get infected, the system uh, will be overwhelmed. And then that's what happened in Italy. We've only got a minute left. You've you live in Hong Kong now, but you have lived many years in Hawaii and worked here. What would you say to your Hawaii friends and, and to the people in our state that, that they can learn from the Hong Kong experience and, and something that would prepare right. them? Uh, right. I will say in this whole process, actually, Taiwan did a better job. Uh, Taiwan did a much better job. They controlled their numbers way down. And because they know they have limited resources, and, and so the government, actually took a big step uh, ahead of everything. Uh, they planned everything ahead. Uh, so the uh, hospital facilities, a location of masks, and uh, you know, uh, controlling the borders, uh, everything. I think uh, Taiwan model uh, can be used by Hawaii. Um, and also, you know, um, Hawaii uh, it has a danger uh, just like Italy, because Hawaii has a huge population uh, of elderly people. I think need to be very careful. Very good. Thank you so much for being with us today. And before you go, if somebody wants to read some of your papers online, right. what is the website that they should go to? Uh, they can go to uh, www.rivermapsolution.com and uh, I will send you the link to my papers and so um, people can you know just easily get to it very good now once again that's rivermapsolution.com rivermapsolution.com yeah, river very good well thank you for being with us dr wong appreciate your spending time today and wish you the very best of health and safety as you continue in hong kong and hope to see you back in hawaii sometime soon thank you very much yes my thank guest you very much Certainly. My guest today, Dr. Mai Wong, an expert in both Western science and traditional Chinese medicine, has a lot of good perspectives to add as we continue to discuss the coronavirus situation. I'm Kaylee Iakina for Think Tech Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until next time, aloha.